Family members of faith from around the world whose hope is in heaven, it's nice to meet you. My name is Jung Jae Sung, an instructor from Shincheonji Church of Jesus. I would like to sincerely thank all the believers, including pastors, for attending our Revelation Seminar today. Just as you've been following our seminar series so far, please open up your hearts wide again today and write these words in them so you can return with deep perception and gratitude to God for His acknowledgement. Before we begin, we'll first offer up a prayer to our Father God. God, our Most Holy Father, we offer up all glory and thanks to You for fulfilling the book of Revelation and the New Testament in today's era and for having us to receive the precious testimony of the fulfillment. It is by Your grace and Jesus' grace that everything is taking place. Please let it be a time of glorifying You and Jesus through this time as we hear Your words today and let us never forget the grace You've shown us. Please be with the instructor who will be testifying to Your word today and allow good and noble hearts for the pastors and congregation members as they hear them so that the seed of Your word can be planted deeply in their hearts. Please be with us from the beginning to the end of this seminar and receive all glory. We pray earnestly in hope and in the name of our Lord Jesus, who is living and working today. Amen. Now's the time of hearing the precious words of life. We'll hear the testimony of Revelation chapter 18 today. Let me introduce you to the instructor who will be testifying to the content of Revelation 18. His name is Lee Jae-sang, who is serving his duty as the Thomas tribe leader of Shincheonji Church of Jesus. Let's welcome up a tribe leader, Lee Jae-sang, with a big round of applause. Greetings. How are you? To all the pastors and the congregants who sincerely loves God and Jesus, it is a pleasure meeting you. All thanks and glory to God and Jesus for allowing the seminar of God's new covenant, the testimony of the prophecies and fulfillment at this time. I am Lee Jae Sang, tribe leader of Thomas Tribe, who was chosen in the name of Thomas, a disciple of Jesus. Greetings to all of you once again. God absolutely fulfills what He prophesied. Also, Jesus fulfilled all the words of the Old Testament prophets in John 19, verse 30. Furthermore, prophecies of the New Testament have been fulfilled today and they appeared as a reality. Prophecies have no reality. However, what has been fulfilled must have a reality, that is, an actual entity. At this time, I will testify to the actual entities. Today, I am going to share with you the words of Revelation chapter 18. Since you have been well informed about the contents of Revelation chapter 17 through the tribe leader last time, today I will go over the content of chapter 18. Chapter 18 contains verses from 1 to 24. The title is, The Marriage with Satan Who Has Destroyed All Nations. But first, I will go over a summary of chapter 18. The location site of these events is Babylon, the home of demons. And the time frame of fulfillment is after the judgment of the prostitute in Revelation 17. 
The content of these events are concerning the judgment of Babylon, the kingdom of demons. Also, who is it that will judge? It is God Himself who will carry out this judgment. Then, let us read verses 1 to 3 in this chapter, and I will explain after. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk demanding wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Yes, we have read verses 1 to 3, and the expression, after this, refers to after the judgment of the prostitute in Revelation 17. It is written, there is a punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, but when looking deeply into it, it turns out the prostitute is also riding on a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. And this prostitute has a golden cup in her hand that was filled with abominable things. Thus, the after this in Revelation 19 is after the prostitute in Revelation 17 is judged. The events that occur after these things is the event of Babylon, the home of demons, falling and being judged. Let's take a look at the reality of the spiritual Babylon, which will fall at the time of Revelation fulfillment. When the prophecy of Revelation is fulfilled, there is no nation called Babylon that exists. However, when this book of Revelation is fulfilled, this Babylon that falls refers to a spiritual Babylon. To explain this a little further, Babylon in this text is a spiritual Babylon that is compared figuratively to the Gentile nation Babylon in the past, who served demons and destroyed Jerusalem, the old chosen people. It is after the prostitutes judge in Revelation 17, the reality of spiritual Babylon is now revealed to the whole world. As we have already seen in Revelation 17 verses 1 to 5, there is a great prostitute who rides on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. This organization that unites together is Babylon. But the reason why they are known as Babylon is because the name Babylon is written on the forehead of the prostitute, which is considered a mystery. They themselves have no idea that they are Babylon because it's a mystery. However, when these recorded events are fulfilled and revealed, the recorded events and their actions and the reality become evidence that they are Babylon. Thus, we need to keep in mind the organization of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which this great prostitute rides that ends up becoming Babylon. This entity is what the new John witnessed and saw at the scene of where the events of Revelation 13 took place. And there is a destroyer who invades the tabernacle of heaven to destroy it. There's a beast that comes up from the sea. There's a beast that comes up from the earth. As they became one, it was revealed that this beast with seven heads and ten horns that destroyed the tabernacle of heaven completely was ultimately revealed to be the organization of Babylon. In Daniel 2, 37-44, just as Babylon was a united kingdom of nations, similarly, even the great prostitute riding on the beast with seven head and ten horns has a position where the power of Babylon are united by several denominations. 
As seen in the reference verse, Babylon is referred to as a haunted place. It is a place where all the evil spirits are gathered, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. And thus, this place is Babylon. In the past, King Nebuchadnezzar's history as a king of Babylon captured and destroyed God's people. However, at the time of Revelation fulfillment, all these evil spirits now enter somewhere and starts to carry out its work. Thus, the reality of such events is now revealed, which also reveals then the identity of Babylon. The reality of spiritual Babylon is referring to the organization of the prostitute in Revelation chapter 17. The organization of this prostitute ends up becoming the Stewardship Education Center and a pastor from the Stewardship Education Center figuratively becomes a prostitute riding on the beast in Revelation chapter 13. The group of Satan who brings down the tabernacle of heaven in Revelation 13 is the Stewardship Education Center. And as they are the group that brought destruction upon the tabernacle of heaven, it is they who appear as a reality of Babylon. The fall of Babylon does not mean a collapse of a building. Instead, it refers to the organization of the prostitute, that is, the stewardship education center being judged and coming to an end. Hence the saying, Fallen is Babylon. Seeing what Babylon has done is like looking into the content of Revelation chapter 17. The kings of the earth are figuratively referring to pastors of the earth. Committing adultery is referring to spiritually committing adultery with the wine of adulteries, which is false lies. Also, the inhabitants of the earth being drunk off the wine of adulteries means that instead of believing in God's word, they believe in teachings that the evil spirits work with, words that are not fitting with the Bible, that is, Satan's lies. It is written that all nations collapsed with the maddening wine of adulteries. We might lightheartedly just think, oh, all nations fell from the maddening wine of adulteries. However, if all nations fell, isn't this a catastrophic occurrence? It is said that all nations collapse from the maddening wine of adulteries. However, when the words of Revelation chapter 18 fulfill and appear, it's not an actual building that collapses and gets destroyed. Instead, when God sees it, the nations united with Satan, and due to the lies in the world of religion, people are receiving the wine of adulteries. That is, they are receiving and believing in the lies that are not according to the word. This is no different than all nations having fallen. Let us now look into the meaning of the wine of adulteries. To understand this content better, let us look into Daniel chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Yes. The reason for reading from the book of Daniel is so that we can understand the content of Babylon. As seen in the word, King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. In short, it says that this king of Babylon is also a huge tree. If the king of Babylon is considered to be a huge tree, what then are the birds that live there? Did it not say that Babylon is a home of demons? The tree then is not God's tree, but Satan's tree.
The bird that rests on Satan's tree is not the Holy Spirit, but an unclean evil spirit. And this tree is Satan's tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not God's tree of life. The fruit on Satan's tree would be the fruit of good and evil, and it's with this fruit all nations were fed. Doesn't that mean they were deceived? And the beasts of the field become beasts belonging to Satan. In the words of Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7, it is said that the choicest vines were planted, but they became evil vines of Gentiles and produced wild grapes. Then wild wine is produced from these wild vines. In the words of Deuteronomy 32, verses 32 to 33, wild wine is the venom of snakes and the poison of cobras. If one eats of this, they will die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said to the religious leaders who had authority at that time that they were serpents and brood of vipers. Didn't Jesus call the scribes and Pharisees serpents and brood of vipers? Jesus said that because it was not the word of God that came out of their mouth, but the fruit of good and evil that deceived and harmed the congregants, like wild wine. Likewise, at the time Revelation fulfills, we can see the prostitute and the organization who is with her in Revelation 17 and 18. Did it not say on her forehead, Babylon? That means it is not God's spirit dwelling with her, but the evil spirits that have infested it. Furthermore, this prostitute can be seen as a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like the Babylon king. Also, the golden cup found in the hand of the prostitute, as seen in Revelation 17 verse 4, is filled with abominable things, and within it contains the filth of her adulteries. That itself becomes the wine of adulteries. It is with this wine all nations are deceived, and just like the beasts of the field were mentioned before, the beast with seven heads and ten horns that the prostitute rides belong to Satan and move by Satan's guidance. Therefore, the fact that the wine of adultery is from Babylon, the organization of the prostitute, in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, deceived all nations, it is just like a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just as the king of Babylon in Daniel 4 is a tree of good and evil. What is produced from the tree of good and evil? It is a fruit of good and evil, which becomes the wine of adulteries. The reality of the wine of adulteries of Babylon is spiritually the food of Satan. It is the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That is, it is commentaries. Commentaries, they say, is a reference book for the Bible. But within the Bible, they put in mixture of all kinds of thoughts, man's teachings, and traditions. However, isn't the Word of God the Word of Truth that is unchanging whether in the past, the present, or the future? Commentaries, though, have all sorts of opinions contained within it. Then what happened? It's because those unclean and detestable birds, they all gathered to move the heart of people and feed them with lies as if it were the word of God. Thus, the reality of Babylon's wine of adulteries is commentaries. When it says all nations have fallen, nations in scriptures is figuratively referring to churches, not 
literal nations. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, it is said that a priest is a messenger of the Lord, that is, a shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10, the word royal priesthood appears. This also means a shepherd. If a shepherd is likened to royalty, a church with a shepherd becomes a nation. Furthermore, all churches in the world belonging to Babylon, including the Tabernacle Temple, becomes figuratively all nations. However, why did it fall? It was destroyed by the wine of adulteries. The wine of adulteries is the fruit of good and evil, and the reality of this is commentaries that is researched and made up by man, which is not given by God. What made all nations fall, I would like to say one more time, is the fruit of good and evil, the reality being the uh, wine of adultery's commentaries. Babylon is the king of demons. Thus, it is recorded, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It is a dwelling place of demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, the gathering of detestable birds, it is not a place where the Spirit of God dwells. So the reason for the healing of these nations is that since the nations have fallen, if they are just left in this condition, they will remain in a collapsed state. But God said that He would restore all nations through the leaves of the tree of life, that is, through the congregants of the 12 tribes of Shincheonji. Once we learn about Revelation 22, verses 1-2, to we will learn about how the fallen nations that were all deceived will be healed through the leaves of the tree of life. Then shouldn't there be a tree of life? This tree of life is the 12 tribes of Shincheonji, the kingdom of God, that has become God's kingdom. How did these 12 tribes of Shincheonji come into existence? Well, According to the promises of the Bible, someone who overcomes appears, and the 12 tribes who are with him are formed. This becomes the kingdom of God that appears according to the promise. The kings of the earth can be understood as the pastors of Babylon. And the merchants of the earth represent the pastors and evangelists who preach the word. Merchants are referred as such not because they are who sell and buy literal goods, where in a way, they sell certain Babylonian goods. The merchants of the earth are those who preach and convey false doctrines. Looking at Hosea 12 verse 7, the merchants can be understood as a pastor. The merchant also has false scales in his hand, meaning they deceive by speaking what is not the word of God, with lies, the fruit of good and evil, as if it were the truth. To love defrauding with these things is to say that they have deceived many souls. And to say they grew rich from their excessive luxuries means that false pastors made their wealth through Babylonian authority and through Babylon's false commodities. That is how they made their wealth, but all these things are exposed as lies, judged and brought to an end, and thus they all meet their end together. Now let us read verses 4 to 5 in the Word. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crime. Yes, we have read verses 4 and 5, and saw the content of my people being called out. The reason why they are being called out is because Babylon is falling, and if God's people remain there, they too will receive plagues together with Babylon. That's why God's people who are in captivity are being called out. 
Would they be able to come out though if the identity of Babylon has not been made known yet? Prophecies do not have a reality yet. However, when the prophecies fulfill the way they are recorded, then actual entities absolutely exist and can also be confirmed. This home of demons, a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, cannot be seen with our eyes. Evil spirits cannot be seen with our eyes. However, as a prostitute is judged and her entire organization is exposed as Babylon, it shows they were united with evil spirits. And isn't it because they are with demons that evil words come out of their mouths? Also, God's people are called out of a place where there are words of evil spirits and words that do not fit the word of God and where the wine of adulteries are overflowing from that place. Then, God's people are being called out when everything is being exposed and at the time of judgment. That is why, according to Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, those who are called, chosen, and faithful followers will be taken out and overcome. Where is the Babylon they must come out from and overcome? When one sees the abomination that causes desolation standing in the holy place, shouldn't they flee to the mountains? This is shown in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 16, and the mountain one must flee to is where the one who overcame and the twelve tribes are at, that is, to Shincheonji, Church of Jesus, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Why must we flee to that place? It's because that's where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirits of heaven come down and dwell with. This is where God resides. It is not a place where unclean, evil spirits dwell. Since it's a place where the Holy God, Jesus, and the thousands upon thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand, Holy Spirits are dwelling together with, we need to flee out of Babylon and go to the place to Mount Zion. The reality of Mount Zion is where the one who overcame and the twelve tribes are at. That is, the twelve tribes, Shincheonji, Church of Jesus, the Temple of the Tabernacle of Testimony. What are these sins and crimes of Babylon? It is said that their sins piled up to heaven. Their sins were so great, it is written, it reached to the heavens. The sins of Babylon was destroying the tabernacle temple. At the time of Revelation fulfillment, the work Jesus specifically does to expose the work of darkness is He chooses and does the work of the golden lampstands. However, Babylon secretly invades, deceives, and does the work of destruction. That is the work Babylon does. Also, they did the work of deceiving all nations with the maddening wine of adulteries. What they did is not a small matter. It is because they have done these things, God does not overlook them, but instead repays and completely judges Babylon, which is a content shown in Revelation chapter 18. Now, we will read Revelation 18 verses 6 to 8. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Yes, well read. Here, we will be able to see how the explanation of how God carries out His judgment takes place. What God said He would do is repay a double portion from their own cup in the same manner of what they did. That means Babylon, or the Stewardship Education Center, will be paid back a double portion for the destruction they brought upon the Tabernacle Temple. Also, as seen in Revelation 13 and Revelation 11, it says that if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. And if anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. The events of Revelation 13 is that the powers of the Stewardship Education Center enter into the Tabernacle of Heaven and brings destruction upon it. 
Thus, the destroyers will be paid a double portion of their own cup, and since destruction period was for 42 months, a double portion of that would equate to seven years, where all their false doctrines and their lies will be exposed and brought to an end. Also, this prostitute boasts that she sits as queen, believing she is above all the pastors. But, in reality, this great prostitute is a pastor within the Stewardship Education Center who has united in spiritual marriage with Satan and the demons, thus making her a false pastor. Also, to lie saying she is not a widow is lying about Jesus, the bridegroom, being with him. If the bridegroom Jesus was really with that person, there is no reason for the maddening wine of adultery to be coming out of his mouth. Shouldn't the word of truth be coming out of his mouth instead? That is why this judgment takes place. Even with this collapse, the prostitute says he sits as queen, he's not a widow, and will not be judged. Eventually, though, he is judged and is brought to an end. It turns out the bridegroom of the prostitute are the evil spirits who have made her into their dwelling place. It says they'll be judged by death, mourning, and famine. What this means is that the false pastors of the Stewardship Education Center at Babylon will be judged according to what they did to the Tabernacle Temple. Isn't it God Himself who judges Babylon directly? Thus, it is God who judges, but it's a righteous judgment. They are rightfully judged as they united with false spirits, spread false seeds of lies, fed maddening wine of adultery to the kings of the earth, leading them to commit adultery, and even deceived all nations. So of course, they are rightfully judged and brought to an end. There is also a saying in scriptures that state, the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah and Lot. At the time of Noah, there was judgment, and at the time of Lot, there was judgment too. However, who was judged? Wasn't it the evil people who were judged? Even at the time of Revelation fulfillment, Babylon, the home of demons, and a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, where all the evil spirits unite to deceive all nations, are those who will be judged. Now, let us read starting from verses 9 to 11. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Yes. Let's learn about the kings and merchants of the earth who are in mourning. Who are the kings and merchants of the earth who committed adultery? As we learned, the reality of the wine of adultery is commentaries, right? And it is all the pastors and evangelists belonging to Babylon who deceive by teaching commentaries to the congregation. After seeing the fall of Babylon, these kings and merchants of the earth are in mourning because they themselves belong to Babylon. The cargoes of Babylon in a nutshell, are all of Babylonians' commodities, that is, the false doctrines of lies that have united with Satan's evil spirit. In addition, there are Satan's ecclesiastical laws, Satan's organization, Satan's authority, and the leaders belonging to Satan. All of this collectively is known as Satan's cargoes. Satan's cargoes do not belong to God. Satan's doctrines, Satan's ecclesiastical laws, Satan's leaders are all Satan's cargoes. The commodities have been created being united with the spirits of demons. Now, let's read further from verses 12 to 14. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, 
fine linen, a purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. They will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. Yes, these verses list all of Babylon's goods. There are many precious things in the world. However, these things are merely being compared to those things of the world. So gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls are not referring to the literal, but instead the various doctrines created by uniting with Satan that they consider precious, like gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, which is not of God though. In contrast, the things of God can be seen in Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46, regarding hidden treasures and pearls. Also, the references of fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth are referring to their Babylonian life of faith, which they consider to be righteous. What is not acknowledged by God and what is not one with the Word are all things that become the cargoes of Babylon. In Revelation 19 verse 8, it says that the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This can be viewed as what is contrast belonging to God. Also, all sorts of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble are referring to materials. Some marble is made of ivory, and these materials are considered very precious. However, these items are used figuratively to refer to various organizations and groups made up of the people of Babylon, which are being referred to as Babylon's cargoes. There are cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, and there are the literal, like real cinnamon, right? However, these things are being used figuratively in this context, and spiritually speaking, they are referring to the ecclesiastical laws that Babylon praises. This is not saying that literal items like cinnamon, spices, incense, myrrh, and frankincense actually belong to Babylon. But instead, these items are truly precious and are necessary for human life. They are used to compare the ecclesiastical laws of Babylon that they praise. There is truly a contrast to these things and the things of God. Isn't the incense going up to God referring to the prayers of the saints? Furthermore, the wine, olive oil, fine flour, and wheat can be looked at as the same. The doctrines of Babylon are figuratively mentioned in this way. Didn't it also say do not damage the oil and the wine that belongs to God? There is what belongs to God, and there is what belongs to Satan, the things of Babylon. And they are both very different from each other. All the cargoes of Babylon are the things that have united with Satan, that has been made up into various organizations, ecclesiastical laws, and doctrines. All these things are collectively known as the cargoes of Babylon. With the fall of Babylon, all the cargoes of Babylon also start to lose its value. Yes, its value falls and those who once considered it precious and valuable is also brought to an end too. The cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, bodies and souls of men refer to the spirit and flesh of leaders who belong to the demons of Babylon. All these things fall under the category of Babylon's cargoes. Simply put, whether it was in the past or currently now, the cargoes of Babylon have been killing and deceiving God's people, which is Satan's lies, the organizations and the people belonging to Satan. What is the fruit that Babylon longs for that is gone from them? The fruit that Babylon longs for is a people of God who were once in captivity by the prostitute and Babylon. The reason why Babylon longs for this fruit is because God's people believe in the true God, serve and worship Him. And Babylon envied this, which is why it deceived them. Babylon deceived them, making them believe in lies. 
But since Babylon's identity is exposed and revealed, the hearts of those that once belonged to lies perceive coming to the realization that what they once thought was truth are actually lies. They perceive it and repent of it and flee to where the true words of God dwell. This is the reason why Babylon gets jealous and the fruit they long for, which they found to be so tasty, is taken away from them. To explain again, having the fruit they longed for get taken away from them means getting evangelized to Mount Zion, being taken from Babylon. This is how to understand the explanation of this portion. Now we will read from verses 15 to 19. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain, all who travel by ship, the sailors, and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Yes, the verses we read were a little long, but to see this picture, everything is adorned with the things of Babylon, and all these items considered precious turned out to be the cargoes of Babylon. However, all these things are judged and eventually brought to an end. Thus, this Babylon that falls, this Babylon that burns, is being judged and everything in it, which is why the merchants of the earth are found to be mourning. Furthermore, the fisherman in this context is not referring to the literal fisherman of the world. The sea in the reference is referring to the world, the ships are referring to churches, and the captains are the pastors. Furthermore, those who travel by ship, the crew members would be the congregation, while the sailors are figuratively those who help the pastors as educators in the church with positions. Regarding the people who make a living off the sea, if the sea figuratively represents the church, wouldn't those working in the sea be considered those who preside over, govern, and run the church? Those who work on the sea will eventually weep and mourn when they see the smoke of Babylon burning, because it will be judged and will come to an end in one hour. Thus, those who work and make a living on the sea refers to those who belong to Babylon and sent out into the world. This Babylon eventually gets judged, destroyed, and brought to an end. However, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony becomes an eternal kingdom that will never be destroyed, an amazing kingdom where God reigns for eternity. In turn, Babylon being judged and brought to an end is like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil disappearing. And since this tree disappears, the only tree that remains is a tree of life, right? Thus, we must perceive the Babylon that falls. And where must one go? We must make sure to go to God's eternal kingdom, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony. That is what it means to perceive the word and keep it. Now, we will conclude by reading from verses 20 to 24. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. 
By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all who had been killed on the earth. Yes, we just read verses 20 to 24 at length and have seen content within these verses concerning what the saints, apostles, and prophets are rejoicing over. They are rejoicing for the reason that Babylon is judged. These spirits of heaven make up the throne of God's kingdom in spiritual heaven. Also, these saints, apostles, and prophets fought evil spirits until death, becoming the spirits who overcame. The reason why these spirits are rejoicing is because their wrath has finally been avenged through the judgment of Babylon. The organization of the great prostitute who made all nations commit adultery appears as a stewardship education center in reality, right? Their judgment is the judgment of Babylon. And because this is the avengement of the martyrs' blood, the heavens, the saints, apostles, and prophets. They are all rejoicing. That is what this means. In addition, we see that Babylon is thrown down like a large millstone thrown down into the sea. But if a millstone is thrown into the sea, is it easy to find after? This is what will happen to Babylon. It is not where after they are judged, they will reappear again and gather. It's not like that. Once Babylon, the Stewardship Education Center, is judged, what will happen is it will eternally disappear. They are the reality of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and this tree must be gone forever for there to be no deception and no one else being deceived anymore, right? The music of harpists of Babylon is referring to the commentaries of destroyers. In contrast, there is God's harp which is referring to the Bible. The custom of Babylon is to teach false doctrines. And the trumpets and trumpeters of Babylon are referring to the people who teach false doctrines. Now, they and their music sounds come to an end. The reason for them coming to an end is because their lies are exposed and they are judged as a result. The workmen of Babylon are pastors who study Satan's doctrines with great precision. Shouldn't God's word be received and delivered? Yes, one must speak God's word on his behalf. If a person creates and devises their own thoughts and conveys their own thoughts, then it will only keep adding, then adding again and adding again to the Word of God. Thus, it no longer becomes God's original will and purpose, but man's teachings instead. Therefore, the workmen of Babylon are pastors who research Satan's doctrines. Regarding the sound of millstones in Babylon, with millstones, the sound of it comes from the mill. The millstone in Babylon is figuratively referring to false pastors who preach Satan's doctrines, and the false lies they speak are the sounds of millstones. Now that all these things are cut off and this sound ends, lies are revealed but you can no longer tell lies. Ultimately, when the truth appears is when lies are exposed quickly and with more certainty. Yes, that is the case. Also, the light of a lamp that never shines again are Satan's teachings and false doctrines. Because their lies are exposed, it loses its power and can no longer act as a light of a lamp. And the voices of the bridegroom and bride that are never heard again means that the marriage with Satan, the devil, comes to an end. The bridegroom of Babylon are the evil spirits, and the bride of Babylon are the congregation who spiritually committed adultery with evil spirits. Since the marriage with Satan completely comes to an end in Revelation 18, who should we wed? It's only the wedding of the Lamb that remains, is it not? That's what we need to understand here. It also says, By your magic spell, all nations were led astray. This means that lies and fortunes were spoken in the name of Jesus for the sake of money. These are lies. They are false. 
But it is with these things all nations fell. This is also what we must understand. Lastly, the blood of the prophets and saints can be found in Babylon. Then doesn't that mean Babylon truly is a place demons dwell? Isn't it truly a hunt for evil spirits? The evil spirits that dwell in Babylon are now revealed as those who have killed all the martyrs in all the generations. Let's now understand the conclusion. In Revelation 18, we see that there is a marriage with Satan who has destroyed all nations. However, this home of demons called Babylon, in reality, is known to be the prostitute and the organization of the beasts with seven heads and ten horns. The occurrence of events is a stewardship education center bringing destruction upon the tabernacle temple. The stewardship education center educated all the pastors across the country with maddening wine of adulteries, that is, commentaries, and made all nations fall with their great power of Babylon. God made known the identity of Babylon, the home of demons to the world, having prophesied in scriptures that he would judge it and bring it to an end which is being fulfilled today. I would like to say that at the time of Revelation's fulfillment, the testimony of the one who was there at the location site is the true testimony. The promised shepherd, the new John, was at the location site to see and hear all these things and is testifying about it. Again, prophecies do not have a reality. However, when prophecies fulfill the way it's recorded, then there absolutely is a reality to what fulfilled. Because there is a reality, one can confirm it, correct? I pray you will believe that this testimony the new John has seen and testifies to is the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 18, the stewardship education center of Babylon is judged, and the marriage with Satan is entirely brought to an end. After this, in Revelation 19, the wedding of the Lamb occurs. This content will be covered next time by our tribe leader who will testify to these things. So I hope you will receive much grace from it. Today, the congregation must be able to discern God's side from Satan's side in Revelation. I hope and pray we all will come out from Satan's dwelling place Babylon and come to Mount Zion, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony and fulfill salvation. Thank you for listening for a long time. Finally, I would like to mention one more thing, pray and then close. Originally, Jesus' church on earth was one. However, just as seen in Daniel 2 and Daniel 4, Jesus' church divided into several parts. One was divided into several, and the many who gathered became like Babylon, where evil spirits were with them. Jesus' church that God formed was one. Yes, one. I hope and pray that everyone who hears will understand these words and offer up all glory to God and Jesus. We are all one in God and in Jesus. I hope we all can become one who knows a true God, who sincerely loves Jesus, so that we can become members of God's family who glorify God and Jesus. We are one. We are one. Let us pray. Father God, who is so holy, we truly thank you. You have granted us a precious day today, allowing us to hear the testimony concerning the prophecies and fulfillment of Revelation, and for that we thank you. We thank you that you granted us the heart to see, hear, and understand. Also, all the realities that occurred at the location of fulfillment took place according to this word. 
And this is being testified to, to the whole world through the promised shepherd, the new John. So we ask that all the hearts who hear will examine it for themselves, believe, and perceive, so that we all can keep your words of promise, act according to it, so that we can all be those who receive your blessings. So Lord, please help us at this time. Please grant understanding and perception to the word, to the pastors first. And please awaken the many congregation so that they can be a part of the work of healing you are doing. We ask for you to bestow your grace upon them. Also, what I earnestly pray is that, Lord, you will guide their hearts with the strong power of the Holy Spirit so they can learn till the end to Revelation chapter 22. I lift up all glory to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who is the origin of life. Amen. I will end lecture here at this time. Thank you very much. It says all nations have married the devil. Everyone, are you a part of the all nations? Or are you outside of them? We can see in Matthew 22 verse 4 that God's oxen and fattened cattle will be prepared for the wedding banquet. Through the word of testimony of Revelation, we are making it known to everyone in the world that the wedding banquet of the Lamb is here. What will you do with this invitation? Did you enjoy watching this video? Aren't you excited? Please do not miss out on our next seminar. I hope all of you will attend and receive great understanding. If you have any questions about the message today, or if there's anything you're curious about, please call the numbers on the screen. We'll answer your questions in a kind manner and further guide you. We'll finish here with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We offer up all glory to our Father God and Jesus. Thank you very much.